Oh, thank you, Chris. Thank you for. Uh, Um, thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for a generous introduction and welcome to Extinction Rebellion and, of course, all of everyone else. Those of you who... Chris always invites me every year for the second term and um, I don't know how many years it's been, must be at least ten or perhaps more, so I've given one every year. And nearly all the talks that um, I've given, not all of them, but nearly all of them, have been on the Miskitu, who are Amerindian people of um, Central America and whom I've been doing field work with in the last, over the last 27 years. And um, uh, I nearly um, was going to... Um, decided not to talk about this and talk about the Mosquito or at least the situation amongst people in Nicaragua because uh, only very, very, very recently that um, I've quite interested in, been interested in and published on land rights amongst the Mosquito and only a very short while ago that um, uh, there was a, a, a Mayangna, who are people who neighbour the Mosquito, they're linguistically related, a Mayangna community in the Bosawas in Nicaragua was attacked by 80 um, settlers, the Colonos, mm -hmm. which are Spanish-speaking invaders, and six um, Mayangna leaders were killed um, in that attack. So I nearly thought to, I'd kind of scrap this and talk about this, but then I thought, well, um, I've got other forum which I can talk to that, and I thought I'd prepared this, and uh, I want to talk about this as well as something um, different. First of all, um, a little bit of um, background um, on this topic, how I came to it, that. Uh, this is really partly the subject of my undergraduate dissertation, so it's not um, entirely um, new to me. This is something which is a kind of quite actually quite an old topic, older than the mosquito uh, for me. And it's really my um, interest in rock and roll and being a young uh, rock and roll um, fan from an uh, early age that I got into this music when I was 16 years old. And when I was 16, I discovered um, what came to be known, has come to be known as doo-wop records, R&B vocal group records, I like other, all other kinds of rock and roll as well, but I was particularly uh, passionate about these that somehow at 16 they kind of spoke to me insofar as many of the singers of the groups I'm going to be talking on were about the same age. They were youngsters. They were um, basically um, young uh, teenagers who were creating um, new kinds of forms of sociality, new kinds of music that were... Um, to be performed in uh, public spaces, in hallways, in street yards, uh, sorry, street corners, in uh, community centres um, and so forth, um, that, uh, at parties, block parties and things like that. And these new, uh, this was music that was um, produced in the first instant to be consumed but in public space. They weren't produced, these songs, uh, and this kind of music wasn't really produced in the first instance to be appear on records as recording, although quite a lot of it did. A lot of it did appear out on records as 45s, those little round seven inch things that you, some of you, the older uh, people will remember, amongst you will remember uh, the before CDs and all of this kind of thing. They, were they came out on those, but they were originally, this kind of music was produced uh, for consumption on the street. So uh, by, and this was mainly produced by um, New York teenagers in a uh, period from the early to mid 50s, all the way through till about the end of the 50s, when as a phenomenon, this kind of rock and roll essentially died out for reasons that I'm, I'm going to um, talk about. What this paper also is really about is, uh, it's about, um, my idea, uh, an idea I have about how um, culture change works. How do cultures change? Now, of course, that in some instances, cultures might change through um, imposition from outside, just as what's happening um, in the Bosawas in Nicaragua, that, you know, um, that things happen from outside and f enforce uh, culture change on peoples of one kind or another. But what I'm interested in here is developing an idea about how cultures change internally. Do they have this, is there some kind of internal dynamic by which cultures change? And this is what I'm really interested in, in the context of this paper or, or this presentation. And, um, so uh, I, I, this is something I'm going to talk about. And um, the reason I think that's interesting for us as members of RAG, that the Radical Anthropology Group is very interested in um, 
uh, cultures that um, haven't really changed very much, uh, foraging cultures where, from what we understand, that a lot of those uh, the traditions in foraging cultures uh, go back a very, very long time. And in that sense, they are um, uh, people in foraging cultures are kind of quite resistant to change. And if we look at, for example, the dreaming amongst um, Australian Aboriginal peoples, for example, we see that much of what goes on in terms of uh, ritual and um, myth and beliefs and and um, social practices are about reproducing the conditions of existence which are the somehow at some sense eternal conditions of existence which are uh, enshrined in the mythology of the dreaming. So um, another way which um, culture and um, some of the ways in which culture change is resisted in foraging societies is through what anthropologists call levelling mechanisms through um, generosity so no one comes uh, gets richer than anyone else through um, making fun of each other um, putting people down who get too big for their boots and so forth um, through gossip um, through gambling all of those kind of things really enforce levelling so people in foraging societies do a lot of work to actually um, ensure equality and that there isn't really a hierarchy and so forth. What I'm looking at, the kind of mechanism I'm interested in today um, is perhaps one of the kind of mechanisms which really subverted um, those kind of levelling mechanisms and what you have is the introduction of a new mechanism which um, in a sense introduces um, asymmetries, hierarchy uh, and so forth. And so, in a sense, this is, if you like, uh, what I'm talking about is possibly, um, it's just a hunch or a, um, an idea or a notion that this mechanism I'm talking about marks, if you like, um, the end of um, equality or egalitarianism and um, the emergence of hierarchy. Uh, this is a bold claim, I know, but um, this is something which uh, uh, occurred to me, that this is how, uh, that the way which culture works is through competitions for prestige which produce hierarchies and what I'm going to talk about is how this actually works looking at some ethnography, ethnography in quite fine-grained um, detail and um, trying to show how that mechanism works. Okay, the first one of the people uh, who I was reading who gave me this idea was uh, Ferdinand de Saussure who was, of course uh, had a big influence on Lévi-Strauss that Saussure is the father of um, uh, modern linguistics and one of the things that Saussure argued that um, he was interested in he said that Saussure revolutionized linguistics by saying that really w what's it's not terribly interesting about how languages change over time uh, well it is quite interesting but where we really need to start is through the synchronic um, uh, examination of languages. We need to look at languages of systems at one given a, a moment in time. The synchronic study of language and by extension culture is the starting point and that's uh, where uh, we really need to begin to describe um, either language or culture. Um, the other point is that, um, that systems of signs in those systems like the sounds that we use in language or the concepts that we have are all relational and mutually dependent upon one another for their meaning so if we look at terms like uh, green and brown and yellow those terms are only meaningful in relation to the other terms which are around them and this is for all kinds of things so meanings are only systems of signs are only uh, all those signs are only meaningful in terms of the systems in which they are um, found so um, he argued, for example, that you can't compare different systems of, of difference at different moments in time, historical time. So um, he argued there's no point trying to make sense of 18th century Parisian French, uh, French by comparison with contemporary uh, Parisian French. They're two different systems. I mean, contemporary Parisian French might have come from uh, 19th, 18th century Parisian French in some sense, but it's undergone um, quite a lot of changes. And um, of course, to make sense of those changes, we need diachronic analysis. But diachronic analysis should be approached as a series of synchronic states. And we look at those synchronic states, how they gradually change. So what Saussure advocated was to make sense of change is looking at gradual changes how one uh, through modeling um, particular moments of th those systems at particular moments and looking how they change um, uh, incrementally through um, small changes. So this is one of the things I'm um, hoping to do here.
So what you have then is that historical linguistics and also social analysis um, in, uh, becomes, uh, um, in other words, a diachronic study, the study of change through time, becomes the study of incremental changes of systems at particular moments, how those systems change incrementally. So, um, okay, so we look at how uh, change actually works and how we look at it incrementally as something which is not kind of very easy to do or and certainly not uh, easy to model in theoretical terms, but nevertheless there have been social theorists who have actually done that. Um, and one of them, of course, is uh, Pierre uh, Bourdieu, who has this theory of practice, and I'm going to be talking about this. This is the idea that, in a sense, in his, one of his probably most famous book, Outline of a Theory of Practice, that what Bourdieu um, actually does is he argues that um, there's this thing called symbolic uh, capital, which is what we might term prestige, and that people compete for uh, that prestige through what Apadurai calls tournaments of value. In other words, they have uh, culturally ideas about competitions where they try and best one another through um, these tournaments of value. And this is how um, uh, hierarchy, symbolic hierarchies emerge through these tournaments of value. And within anthropology, of course, we've seen things like potlatch, which are these exchange of gifts uh, in the northwest coast, or, Malin or Kula, as described by Malin Malinowski, where you have these tournaments of value where people try to give each other things to try and best each other, to try and um, show that they're better than others and acquire symbolic capital in those kind of ways. So um, Bourdieu's idea is that human beings, uh, human action, human um, uh, meanings are essentially determined by competitions for prestige. This is essentially my reading of what outline of a theory of practice is all about. And Bourdieu tries to look at some of the mechanisms of that in terms of ideas like uh, symbolic capital and symbolic violence, uh, where you have these competitions between individuals or groups to establish uh, some kind of symbolic domination through acquiring symbolic capital at the expense of others. So this is uh, Bourdieu's idea. Giddy Giddens has a, a period, a, a theory of structuration, which I'm not really going to talk about today because I'm more interested in applying Bourdieu's uh, model of um, um, social action to what I'm going to look at. But both of these actually are um, structuralist insofar as both of them advocate looking at social structure to make sense of those kind of changes. And um, this is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to try and you um, make sense of the kinds of change that I'm going to be talking about in terms of structuralist, a structuralist model of change. But a structuralist model of change, um, whoops, uh, oh, where did I go? Yeah, uh, 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 implies that it means that in order to do that, a change which comes from in of itself, it requires some kind of theory of human motivation. And what I like about Bourdieu's theory is, is, is it does have a theory of motivation. And as I said, it's this motivation for if you like, capturing symbolic capital through um, besting others, through uh, um, competition with others and acquiring or collecting the symbolic capital from others in a zero-sum game where if you become, acquire symbolic capital at the expense of someone else that their stock of symbolic capital is depleted in some sense. So it's about uh, establishing hierarchies of prestige. This is uh, what I'm really um, talking about in the context of... Um, this particular uh, uh, paper. So, um, just before I come on to the ethnography, um, I just want to say something briefly about structuralist models. That there's this assumption that structuralist models are um, necessarily um, static in some sense. Um, so. Uh, that I don't think is uh, 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 necessarily the case, uh, that structuralist models um, needn't be static, as I think Bourdieu uh, argues. And um, um, although Levi-Strauss um, can't really account for how um, uh, um, cold societies uh, or hot, uh, without those societies without history become acquire, have acquire a, 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 a history, if you like, that this is something I won't talk about now, but perhaps at question time, that my, this, what I'm going to talk about today perhaps offers us perhaps some clues about that might ha how that might happen. And it's not also not necessarily the case that structuralist models are static. If we look at something like Victor Turner's uh, classic uh, schism and continuity in 
uh, African society, which looks at the Ndembu. It looks at how uh, one can account for, ch uh, for change and how um, Ndembu villages are um, quite short-lived and how marriages are brittle by looking at the logic of change internally through the internal dynamics of um, Ndembu society and the matrilineal puzzle and all of those kind of things. Also uh, Leach um, in um, uh, political systems of Highland Burma also looks at how change might be explained um, in the context of different systems of uh, political hierarchy and how hierarchy and equality are in this, uh, if you like, oscillating system between one and the other in the context of the Kachins of Highland Burma. So this is, unlike uh, Turner, this is another account of how a structuralist model might make sense of change and provide some kind of uh, logic for how that change works. Um, Okay, so um, as I said, uh, structuralist models of change require an assumption of human motivation. And as I said, I'm going with this idea of Bourdieu's about, um, if you like, the search for prestige as being the, um, the uh, if you like, what brings about social change. Right, um, so in this culture under review, what I'm going to talk to about today is uh, that there are two um, essential assumptions. The first is that uh, individuals um, are engaged in tournaments of value. So in other words, they uh, compete with one another and that these generate symbolic currencies which mark status hierarchies. And you think, well, I'm not sure any about, I know anything about that. Is that uh, anything part of the world that I know about? Well, maybe it is. Maybe those dinner parties that all of you have been going to at one time or another are tournaments of value in which um, uh, the status differences are sort of contested in the context of um, uh, you know, uh, fine wining and dining and so forth. The second assumption is that um, individuals subscribe to an what Foster famously called the image of the limited good. And this is the idea that all the good things in life, health, wealth, and good luck, all of those things I exist in finite supply. And that includes prestige, that if someone is uh, prestigious, uh, then someone else has to be, it's at someone else's expense that they're less prestigious. So this is the other um, assumption um, which uh, I'm uh, going to uh, make in terms of this analysis. Right, that's the theoretical stuff, the background for this paper. I'll come back to it briefly, but now what I want to talk to you is about the ethnography that, uh, if you like, explores this kind of idea. And what I want to talk to you about is um, a phenomenon which has come to be known as um, doo-wop music. Doo-wop music was a style of music, as I said, which was uh, primarily um, uh, produced for uh, and consumed on the street. Although there are recordings of uh, many doo-wop records that were aimed for the teenage market, that this kind of music was essentially uh, designed really in the first instance, the motivation for making this kind of music was in the context of uh, street, uh, street corner competitions, at block parties, community centers, talent uh, uh, contests, all of those kind of things. So it was kind of music that was generated and um, produced and uh, put together by groups of teenagers, quartets and quintets, um, uh, who would sing in harmony with one another. And this music um, was a cappella, it was without instrumentation. So these groups are young teenagers, primarily in um, uh, ghetto neighborhoods in North American cities, where you have quartets and quintets who are producing uh, if you like, uh, little songs which are based on um, harmonies. So typically these quartets and quintets feature um, a, a lead tenor, a second tenor, a bass, a baritone, and sometimes a high tenor or not. So they're quartets or quintets and they're singing a cappella music. A cappella means without any instrumentation. And this is why are they performing on street corners and all these other things, because you can produce a cappella anywhere. You don't need instruments. And most of the teenagers who were producing it, they didn't have access to instruments. Uh, they didn't have um, uh, the money to buy instruments. So they record these um, songs a cappella. And much of the arrangements that these teenagers uh, produced for this music were actually uh, th that they would use the f different voices, like I said, there were four or five singers, to create something of a dense kind of sound that they would produce harmonies. Now, before I go any further, I want to say that this kind of music is very different to uh, barbershop quartets. 
I don't like barbershop music at all. I love doo-wop music. They're very, very different. I'm not going to go any further than to say that, distance myself, don't think that you're hearing something about barbershop quartets or quintets. That's completely different. Um, right, um, first of all, where did this kind of music um, actually come from? Well, originally, it, probably the roots of it, or most of the roots, come from the popular vocal groups of the 1940s, such as the Ink Spots, Mill Brothers, Delta Rhythm Boys and others. These were groups of adults who would produce a kind of style of music which was aimed not just at... Uh, 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 it wasn't really race music in the sense race music was the term that was used by the music industry in the United States in the 40s and 50s for music that was aimed for black audiences. And these popular vocal groups um, at this time were aimed towards the so-called race markets, but also towards the popular market. So they were aimed at all generally. This is popular music, yeah? And um, it was... Uh, uh, um, but this is part of the roots of doo-wop music. Um, I'm calling it doo-wop music. I'm going to distance myself from that term doo-wop in a bit because doo-wop was really not... That term wasn't used at the time. They were called rhythm and blues vocal groups. This is really the origins of rhythm and blues vocal groups. So, um, groups like the Ink Spots, the Mills Brothers and the Delta uh, Rhythm Boys, there were lots of groups uh, around in the 40s. But the important thing to know is that these were adults. This is not street corner music. These are music of um, uh, adult... Uh, performers who uh, create uh, vocal harmonies and then they're, they're primarily interested in uh, recording and performing with bands, in other words with um, uh, instrumentation behind them sort of thing. But um, from the 1940s, as we have come into the, um, um, into the 50s, from about 1949 um, afterwards, we have um, a new kind of style of music by adult groups um, who, and these adult groups um, are really, they're not really interested in the popular market. They want to go for what is called the race market. They are aimed at um, uh, black audiences. They are interested in the uh, pub the urban uh, black audiences um, in places like New York and Washington and Detroit, Chicago, Los Angeles and so on. And these groups, um, like the Orioles, the Swallows, the Ravens, these were called these kind of groups. And there were lots of them, they're not just these three, there were lots and lots and lots of these groups. These um, have been come to be known as, uh, later on, uh, people who study this kind of music call them bird groups because a lot of them, like the Orioles, the Swallows and the Ravens, were named after birds. The idea was that they could sing like birds. And these have made some... Uh, 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 the, these, but the thing about the Orioles, the Swallows and the Ravens, what they did was, uh, with these uh, groups, was that they, eschew, es they didn't really like the kind of pop bits of the music that were in the, um, these earlier groups, like the Ink Spots and the Mills Brothers and so forth. And what they introduced was a much more um, uh, rhythm and blues kind of sound. So there wasn't really any concession in the, um, record in the recordings and in the, uh, of these groups towards, uh, if you like, popular music. These were very much rhythm and blues records, um, recordings. And um, they were uh, mainly of two kinds. The one kind was the, um, the ballad, so they'd sing these ballads, but these ballads were, um, if you're very much like rhythm and blues in um, their, um, uh, the way that they uh, were performed and sung and so on. And the others were jump songs, which were very much uh, around, um, or um, composed around 12-bar blues and so forth. So you had, uh, on one side, you'd have, um, a, a, if you like, a jump sound, which was very much uh, like 12-bar blues, except, of course, you'd have um, saxophones and pianos and drums and guitars behind it. And then the other side, you'd have the same. You'd have a rhythm and blues band behind you, but you'd be performing these ballads. But these ballads were kind of very kind of, if you like, what came to be known as, I've got no other way to describe it other than what some people call it sweet and greasy. In other words, they were very rhythm and blues, these ballads. They were not at all aimed at pop audiences. So these bird groups were, if you like, um, uh, very influential for um, the teenage groups that came after them. So now, if we talk about the emergence of specifically teenage rhythm and blues, local groups in New York 
that where they come from is that these were young groups of teenagers who would get together in um, schools, in, on the local streets, um, at community centres, wherever they'd meet each other, that you find teenagers would get together and imitate the groups like the Orioles, the adults like the Orioles, the Swallows, the Ravens, they'd get together and try and imitate the bird groups, uh, what later on called, came to be called the bird groups. So these were um, young teenagers, and what you found amongst these young teenagers, which you hadn't got with the adult groups, was that so many of these teenagers were doing this, that you'd have um, competitions for prestige amongst these groups. These groups were really uh, competing um, to attract girls, to attract uh, prestige, and what they would do is they'd engage in tournaments of value within their neighbourhoods and also across neighbourhoods by uh, engaging in battles of song. And so you'd have these groups would be battling for prestige with another. And what's very interesting is that um, these were in places like um, in New York, in places like Harlem, in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, um, Sugar Hill. Um, these were really ghetto uh, neighbourhoods where you'd find um, these tournaments of value and these battles of song by the kids who were, or these um, young people who were um, as young as um, uh, um, 13 up to about you know 19 or something. They were teenagers, they were really young and they'd create, they'd write their own songs for the most part, sometimes they'd take standards, they'd create their own songs, set harmonies to them, they'd try and get uniforms if they were prestige competitions like in a community centre and they'd try and um, uh, compete with one another for prestige with other similarly constituted groups. And what you found at this time was, um, in, um, by about 1952, 1953, you had this displacement in New York of gang warfare by singing contests, um, by these singing these battles of groups. And these were because that many of these teenagers from this background were in, had been engaged in gangs, in gang warfare. Many of the, some of the singing groups had actually been street gangs, um, such as groups like the, the Paragons and the Charts had been street gangs. And what you found also was with the appearance of the, um, this phenomenon, the street battles phenomenon, was that you had the, um, uh, that you, that the, those uh, gangs who continued to fight accorded the singing groups a diplomatic immunity so they could walk through other people's turfs uh, because they were a difference, they were accorded diplomatic immunity. Of course that didn't altogether work, for example um, Little Antony of the Imperials who became quite well known as a, a, as a singer later on in his um, life that he remembers talking about how he had to join one of these fighting gangs, the Chaplains, who were one of the most feared um, uh, uh, groups in New, uh, gangs in New York so that he could uh, obtain part of that diplomatic immunity he had to join one of the gangs but in many cases that um, that the gang uh, that uh, singers were afforded this diplomatic immunity and um, so you had this displacement in many areas not all areas but in some areas you had this displacement of gang warfare by uh, singing contests and what's very interesting is that a fellow called David Toop who's written about the emergence of rap in New York in the early 70s we talked about the same phenomenon where um, rap crews, the emergence of rap crews in the early 70s, um, displaced gang warfare in many parts of New York. So this is something which comes predates what happened um, in, uh, with the rap phenomenon, that you have these, uh, again, you have performance displaces, um, uh, art, if displaces gang warfare in both turns. So you have um, teenage gangs, some of them are actually now um, turning to street uh, singing. Of course, remember, this is kind of singing is something that goes on in, in the street. Um, one of the, th uh, the interesting things about these street gangs is that many of the, um, uh, of the sorry, of these groups, these vocal groups, is before many of them actually um, become uh, vocal groups, become R&V uh, vocal groups, that many of them start off in, the pre uh, in their pre-teen years is there's a different, in a different kind of associations which are also performative, that you have many of the even younger um, uh, pre-teens that what they would do is get together with little bongos and tin cans and uh, they would beat out all these kind of rhythms and do little skits and sometimes songs and little narrations. And one finds this, that Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers, who are a famous um, vocal group, actually started like that. Um, the Sky uh, Skylarks, who became the Harp Tones, started off like that. And there's a wonderful, on YouTube, and there's a wonderful, uh, you can find um, some recordings of these. If you go to, there's recordings uh, by um, a sociologist uh, called Sorensen, who, who 
uh, created a, an LP called Street and Gangland Rhythms about these pre-teens who uh, would have these little bongo skits. And, um, but many of these groups actually emerged, these sodalities, these uh, groups of singers emerged from those like, little percussion ensembles of pre-teens. So how did then, uh, what did they uh, do, these groups, to how did they compete with one another? And what I want to do is talk now briefly about the kind of symbolic um, resources uh, that they had. Um, th the kind of symbolic uh, resources that they had were one of them was strong, the street songs. So you had um, good street songs um, which um, members of different groups would write, uh, would write and if your songs were better than another group's songs that the girls might drift to you and you might be accorded um, a, a, a greater prestige through doing that. So some of the famous street songs were I, Lily, My Bell, My Dearest Darling, Raindrops Are Falling, lots of others. There are literally um, hundreds of these street songs which have ended up being recorded because a lot of these groups actually began to be taken into studios by um, small local record labels that otherwise would focus on blues recordings that they'd bring them in into their um, and give, get put a rhythm and blues band behind them and what they had been doing a cappella in other words singing without bands that they'd come on to um, into the studio and uh, these label owners would get them to record those same songs but with a band behind them so the recordings that um, you hear uh, uh, the, or the records if you buy of this kind of music have bands behind them but this is not how they were originally performed they were performed a cappella on the street. One thing about street songs though is that they have a, had a habit of the best ones of being uh, pinched from one another so sometimes people would say oh let's not sing such and such a song because so and so of another group is here and they'll take that song if we, um, if we sing it. So this is something that happened quite a lot so uh, for example I that was recorded by the Velvets was originally uh, performed by a group called the Delroys, um, Lily May Bell, which was uh, recorded by the Valentines and became known for the being the Valentines. That was a street song in the Bronx and it was, came, uh, um, was pinched over to uh, Manhattan by other groups and it was the Valentines who then recorded it and had a minor hit with it. Uh, My Dear Dearest Darling is another one, um, Raindrops Are Falling and so on. And these were songs that were basically uh, pinched by other groups and uh, people, as I said, sometimes some of these singers would uh, deliberately not sing some of those songs. The other thing was uh, good singers. So um, you had uh, one of the symbolic resources was good singers. And what you found here is that sometimes that groups would poach one another's best singers. And this, this is something I'm going to um, talk a little bit about. Um, another way with symbolic resources is through elaborate and expensive uniforms. So um, many of these uh, youngsters that they try and get expensive um, uniforms, matching uniforms to record on not just on the street corner, but when they were uh, doing certain events at parties or talent contests or community centres, that they'd try and get uniforms. Um, some of them really spent out a lot of money, money that they couldn't afford. So the idea that they were doing this for money is... Um, is not really borne out by the ethnography because um, some of them were so poor, uh, some of them uh, really had to pull out a lot of money and so some, a group like the Ladins, for example, had to borrow Little Antony and the Imperials uniforms to actually perform because the Ladins were so poor that they couldn't afford that. And other groups, even like the famous Cadillacs, the Cadillacs who became very well known, that they um, were, even when they were doing very well, they were still massively in debt for all of the uniforms that they'd actually bought on credit. The other thing was they also, some of the groups began to uh, spend a lot of time on elaborate uh, choreography. So the vocal tones, for example, spent allegedly five hours a night, every night, just on their choreography aside from their singing because they do little kind of uh, movements when they're performing in harmony and so forth. So this is um, kind of quite an expensive business and these are all, if you like, an inventory of um, the symbolic resources at these groups' disposal. Now, one of the things also is you have to bear in mind just how dense the uh, arenas of competition were. So, for example, 115th Street, which is in the centre of Harlem, this is just a small selection of some of the groups that you've got, the Five Crowns, the Harp Tones, uh, the Willows, the Bop Chords, um, the Whirlers, the Cellos, 
uh, keynotes. These are among some of the groups who are known now. This is a really um, a lot of groups in a very small uh, area. And this is only a fraction of the group. So like every boy, Philip Abraham's talking about the similar phenomenon in Philadelphia, right? So every boy who's in a group can, who can sing is in a group, basically. Um, you have in Brooklyn, you have other groups like um, the Impacts, uh, the Velours, uh, the Fantastics, the Five Chimes, the Chesters, uh, who became Little Antony and the Imperials, and so on. Um, that in the Bronx, that you've got another clusters of groups who are all in competition with one another, each trying to um, uh, uh, establish local hierarchy within that area. So you've got groups like the Wrens, the Chords, um, the Crickets, and the Heartbreakers, and so on. Up in 142nd Street, you've got the Vocalayers, the Dovers, the Opals, and others as well. And in Sugar Hill, um, you've got um, a number of other groups like uh, uh, the Valentines, the Velvets, and of course, Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers. So these are areas, just, just what I want to show you with this slide is just how dense this area of competition. This is a way of life for teenagers in New York. All teenagers in New York at this age, uh, in these kind of areas, who can sing are in a group. Um, now, what you have is um, the emergence of um, hierarchies amongst these groups. As these groups begin to compete with one another, you have the emergence of hierarchies. So, by 1952, within Harlem, that the vocaliers are supposedly the top street kind of corner group. Uh, in, um, by, by 1953, they're displaced by the Carnations, who become later the Cadillacs, and uh, they gain a local supremacy um, in the part of Harlem where they are. Um, same is true with the Valentines um, in um, the Sugar Hill area. And of course, in 1955, they have this hit with a street, king, uh, a, a street song called Lily May Bell. And Lily May Bell came out on a Rama label, which is very typical of these little local labels that was picking up these uh, groups of um, youngsters and uh, recording them with bands. George Goldner, who was known as the Street Corner King because he'd go around uh, getting these groups into the studio and not giving them very much, but getting them to make records, some of them amazingly, which came to be local or national hits. So what you have in terms of the emergence of these hierarchy, of this hierarchy, is that you have the leading groups of, uh, begin to expropriate the symbolic assets. In other words, they're pinching their best songs and their best singers of the lesser groups. And what starts off as a, a level playing uh, field, if you like, uh, begins, you begin to have uh, emergence of a hierarchy as some groups through these competitions, through these tournaments of value, become uh, more important or, or more um, prestigious than other groups. And the lesser groups begin to uh, disintegrate and eventually you have this situation where no new groups no longer appear. It's not really worth it because the top groups have so much prestige. The other people give up and that's the end of the uh, vocal group phenomenon and the return to gang warfare, if you like. So um, this is, if you like, um, uh, the trajectory of this kind of uh, the history of what's going on here. So first of all, I want to talk, give you a couple of just case studies. And the first one I want to look at is the Cadillacs, who um, became quite a, lot, a big group. Uh, the Cadillacs started off as the uh, Carnations. One thing with the, car the Cadillacs is they were very good at, um, as many of the top groups who became, of pinching other members of other groups. So they managed to pinch Earl Wade from the Opals, who um, were a, a local group in their area from, this is around 142nd Street in Harlem. Uh, Jimmy Bailey from the uh, Velvetones, and the Velvetones were the Carnations' a bitter rivals, so this is something of a coup. They managed to uh, also uh, pinch uh, a couple of some of the chords for it, who were also with the Velvetones. And so um, this is um, really the Cadillacs are able to, if you like, uh, displace the Velvetones as the top group in this particular area, in this local rivalry. So in these battles of songs, the Carnations or Cadillacs, stroke Cadillacs, are able to um, uh, outcompete the Velvetones by basically pinching all their best singers. The Solitaires I want to talk about were another group. Um, that's a publicity shot from the, for them. And the, the Solitaires were even better at this. They, they pinched uh, members of the Crows, the Vocaliers, the Four Bells. They pinched three members of the Mellow Moods. The Mellow Moods were a group so young that when they finished their recordings of um, I Didn't Sleep a Wink Last Night, um, that they rushed home to reputedly to watch the listen to the Lone Ranger on the radio. They were, you know, these are really young kids, I have to say. <laughs> 
uh, the pinched members of the Concords and the Velvetones as well. So the Solitaires are another good group, who are a group who do very well from by pinching other singers. And you can see that both of them did quite well because they made it to the Harlem Apollo where they were um, performing and this is the kind of aim of many of the top groups. Uh, you could know you were a top group if you appeared at the Harlem Apollo. So there's the Cadillacs and the Solitaires which are um, there on the bill. The vocal tones um, did the same thing, um, so they appropriated members of um, uh, 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 others, they appropriated um, members of the vocalists. In fact, they really emerged out of the, the, um, uh, the vocalist jealousies, meant that they broke up and they appropriated Roland Martinez, members of the uh, Pretenders who uh, and the Dovers and so on. So this is a pattern that goes on, that you have this appropriation of, um, uh, uh, of the, the top members of those kind of, uh, uh, or the, the of singers of other groups. And this is one way you become better and outcompete other groups and you emerge up this um, um, hierarchy of groups by acquiring and utilizing the symbolic capital of other groups. Now, I want to talk a little bit about um, the appropriation of street songs. So, for example, um, uh, there's one song called uh, My Dear Dearest Darling. Um, and that was um, originally, there was a, a group called the Lotharios um, sang it. Um, and they sang it at a talent night at the Harlem Apollo. But um, they were a not very well thought of group and they were booed off. But nevertheless, the Skylarks thought that their song was good enough to pinch. And they took it and it later had it as their first record. So the Skylarks um, did very well from pinching this street song. You've got Lily Mae Bell is the classic street song and um, this was a group called the Gaytones in um, um, the Bronx, but then um, the Velvets uh, took Lily Mae Bell, they took it, they went to the Bronx, they heard this and they took it to 142nd Street in um, Harlem, where it was other groups picked it up. So the Velvets, Keynotes and Valentines all started performing Lily Mae Bell. And it's best known for the Valentines because the Valentines actually redu uh, produced a record of it, which George Goldner, the Street Corner King, put out a record of the Valentines with a backing band behind them singing um, Lily Mae Bell. So these street songs are um, also pinched uh, from one another. And, um, you know, as I said, that sometimes that, uh, people would say in these groups, well, let's not sing such and such at a particular event because so-and-so from this other group is here and they're going to actually uh, pinch it from us. So there's this um, protection attempt to protect, protect one's, uh, if you like, symbolic resources from the raids of others. So... Now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how this changed and the mechanisms of change that I promised you I'd try and talk about. The first thing is we want to look at the kind of structure of the song. Basically there were two kinds of songs and this is very evident when one looks at the records that were actually produced of these groups that you have usually, very typically, almost always, you have one kind of song on one side and the other kind of song on the other side. So one kind of song is the ballad. These were uh, most of these, many of these songs were ballads, and for them that they were slow tempo, and they had um, they were typically eight or sixteen bars in length, and they had verse and chorus order. So you had verse, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse. Um, the orientation was mainstream, and from that um, I make the distinction from Ulf Hannertz, who talks about in his book Soulside the distinction between mainstream and um, ghetto specific that mainstream orientation, the ghetto-specific orientation, is about this idea that, um, uh, that you know, we live in the ghetto and, the, uh, you know, the kind of idea of the trickster and um, drinking alcohol and, um, you know, sleeping around and all those kind of things. And then there's the mainstream or orientation, which is more focused on what is at least is the perception of mainstream American values, romantic love, and uh, all of those kind of things. So the orientation in the Ballad Street songs is mainstream um, orientation. The mood was pessimistic, and some examples of this from the streets are the vocalists, I Walk Alone, A Window Lady by the Cadillacs. These are two um, examples of those kind of street songs. The other kind was called the, was the Jump Street song, and that was completely different. The tempo was fast. Um, they were organized around 12 bars, because the, their roots was in blues music, so there were 12 bar blues. And the verse and order was simply, there were verses, there were 12 blars of several verses, so they didn't have choruses. The orientation was ghetto-specific, uh, 
and the mood was excitement, not pessimistic. And some examples of this are the crystals, squeeze me baby, or the skylarks, fine little girl. These are examples. These are essentially like um, vocal groups singing what's really a like uh, blues, if you like, but in these kind of uh, harmonies. So they're very different, two different kinds of street song. And th these are both part of the symbolic inventory of these songs. Now, what happens then is that all of a sudden, there's this revolution in these street songs whereby somebody produces, one group produce, or one or two groups begin to produce an altogether different kind of street song which pr propels them right up, because it's accepted, right up the uh, prestige hierarchy. And this is a record called G by the Crows. Now, what G by the Crows was really um, about was that it was essentially structured in the same way. All of these things are exactly the same as the ballad, except instead of the tempo being slow, it was fast. Um, and the uh, verse uh, bar organization was like the ballad, eight or 16 bar bars, with also with choruses. The orientation was mainstream. But the mood was optimistic. And this is a new kind of street song that comes into being. This is a new kind of street song. Examples of this are a G by the Crows and the Chords um, uh, for, who are from the Bronx have a song called Shaboom. And um, these are new kinds of, um, a new kind of street song, which I've called here doo-wop. The term doo-wop wasn't really coined until 1961 by a DJ called Gus Gossett. But I'm using this term anachronistically to distinguish it between the ballad on the one hand, um, which is, if you like, from which this song kind of doo-wop song is a mutation, and the jump songs, which are altogether different. What happens now is that the doo-wop song begins to replace the jump song. So the jump song is now redundant, and you've got this new kind of song, which all these vocal groups have to now write, produce songs, compose songs, which are completely different because the jump song is now redundant and you've got this new kind of song, uh, which is the doo-wop song, which is altogether completely different. And those groups who adopt this song very quickly start to move up the prestige hierarchy very, very quickly. So Shaboom by the Chords is another example, um, just as G by the Crows was another. Um, Come Back My Love by the Wrens is another example. That's on the street corner, uh, uh, King George Goldner, his label, Rama and so on. Um, church bells may ring by the Willows on 115th Street and so on. And what you have is for the Willows, for example, is very interesting because they had an intense rivalry with a group called the Bop Chords. And the Bop Chords had, were the more prestigious, that they were um, a more prestigious group. They were thought to be better looking, had better songs and everything. But what they didn't have was a doo-wop song. They had just the jump songs and um, the ballads. So the Willows came along, they cottoned on to what the Crows were doing very quickly and produced a doo-wop song. And all of a sudden, the, the, all the girls started drifting to the Willows, who became the, the top group on 115th Street. And after that, the uh, bop chords started to change and started to do songs of the same kind. But by that time, the Willows had already stolen their thunder sort of thing. So you've got these three different songs. Uh, uh, first of all, just to recap, you've got the ballad. Originally, you've got the ballad and the duo, uh, sorry, the ballad and the jump um, uh, songs. But the jump song is really dispensed with as people discard that as a, a, as a, a form of performance and start performing doo-wop songs. Now, an example of this, who one uh, teen, a group who did very well with this was a group called Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers. And that's Frankie Lyman with the street corner king, George Goldner, who's um, brought a lot of these groups into, as I said, into the studio. This is Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers. And Frankie Lyman um, was able to do this now so successfully, the Teenagers were able to make this move so successfully that um, they advanced, this is uh, later on, by this time that the new, this new style, the doo-wop uh, songs have become, if you like, quite important. But the teenagers um, have got onto this and they're doing this so successfully that now other groups find that they can't compete with them. And the teenagers become, have a national hit. They start having national hits. And after that time, the other groups think, well, we can't compete with this. And the whole um, system of groups sing harmony as a phenomenon begins to dissolve. And we have this return to gang warfare that the whole vocal group phenomenon had originally managed to elbow out. It returns because after you have these hits by Frankie Lyman and one or two other groups that are now not just local hits, but are national hits, that the, the smaller groups, all the little groups and middle groups in terms of the prestige hierarchy, 
find that they no, can no longer um, uh, compete with one another. So um, this is what's um, uh, 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 going on here. So um, um, what um, is just want to reach some kind of conclusions here that prestige here I am arguing here is encoded in consecutive series of currencies. Yeah, so you've got currencies and. Um, Three of the currencies which I've talked about are, uh, or the currencies that were first produced by these kind of uh, teenage groups were um, the ballad, this particular ballad, which had a particular structure, and the jump songs, which had a, also had a quite different kind of structure. There were, one was based on, um, if you like, uh, uh, eight or ten bars and had choruses. The other was based, uh, had its origins more in the blues. If you like, you had these two kind of uh, currencies. What happens then is that one of these currencies is displaced. So prestige um, and competitions for prestige are encoded in these different kind of currencies. What you find is tournaments of value, of what I've argued, these competitions produce hierarchies amongst those who are involved in playing this kind of game, this kind of symbolic um, in this symbolic arena that you have these tournaments of value which are producing these kind of host, uh, hierarchies. Now what happens as individuals, or in this case groups, come to monopolise symbolic capital, and this could be um, uh, the forms of um, the, the uh, or the songs, that perhaps that what happens then is that these symbolic, um, uh, these currencies um, uh, begin to devalue. So first of all you have the devaluation of the jump songs and then later on you have the devaluation of the whole vocal group phenomenon because um, as individuals or groups come to uh, monopolise particular symbolic capital that those groups devalue. So those currencies are only recognised if people think that they have a chance to actually get in on it and compete and actually do something to move up the prestige ladder. If they can't do that then they won't recognise it anymore. The currency devalues or disappears Appears. This is what happens to um, the vocal group phenomenon as a whole. So this devaluation um, of some currencies, it produces innovation and the appearance of new symbolic currencies. So this is what happened with the, um, the, uh, the ballads, it's not the ballads, the jump songs. The jump songs um, became um, a, a, a uh, uh, devalued and they become what you have then is a new currency which is uh, the doo-wop song is this new currency and so what you have is this competition um, uh, this it's competition um, through in the, within these tournaments of value which uh, through this idea of that people can still compete and then the, when they reach the point that no one can compete with those who have accrued the most symbolic capital that the value of the particular currencies in which they're encode, encoded actually began to no longer be recognised, they disappear and you have a new form of a new um, game in town, a new symbolic currency. So this is really, it's prestige which is the motor of cultural change. This is what I'm arguing in, in this presentation, that it's the, the competitions for prestige which produce a cultural change. And perhaps we might look at something like uh, Potlatch, for example, in, uh, for, the, for that, which is competitions and tournaments of value in the northwest um, uh, coast area of North, uh, of North America, where you have this other time. And what's interesting about Potlatch is that Eric Wolf has argued in Europe, Europe and the People Without History, who's looked at the historical evidence, is that Wolf has argued that these new, um, that with uh, Potlatch, that there was this inflation as the potlatch uh, giveaways became more and more intense and more and more property was being given away or destroyed that um, it, it, it really that was one of the things that brought about a part of uh, the breakdown in the potlatch system of course it was also uh, banned by the uh, North, uh, uh, United States and Canadian authorities for a while but part of it was also because um, uh, people just found that they couldn't compete with it anymore and no longer began to recognize it so Wolf talks about this um, in Europe and the Peoples Without History, looking at the historical work of others, that you have this um, thing with uh, this symbolic inflation 
uh, within potlatch. Um, you might look also for further evidence of this, this kind of, uh, if you like, uh, ways by which cultures might change by looking at some of the Melanesian currencies, such as um, uh, shell exchanges, uh, exchanges of pigs in the context of the New Guinea highlands for things like mocha or, um, uh, uh, um, and other forms of uh, currency um, in Melanesia. So um, just to sum up, um, this is what I'm arguing, as I said again, is that prestige is encoded in currencies. Those currencies, as they're exchanged and um, uh, competed for through tournaments of value, that what happens is that once they reach a point that people can't compete or groups can't compete within that, that they, um, uh, uh, those currencies are no longer find any kind of recognition and that currency um, disappears or uh, deflates and a new currency comes into being. And um, it's uh, this, I argue, which might be a sort of one mechanism that accounts for um, culture change in purely internal rather than deus ex machina terms. All right, I'll stop there. <laughs>